good morning and also we have here uh, professor christopher gomez as our guest speaker today and yesterday we have done a, a series of sharing session uh, with students and also gain a lot of knowledge about the high resolution point clouds and also its application on various uh, geomorphology and also we also have a short course about publication uh, tips with as lecturers and to have, today we will have another interesting session with the UMS lecturer and also here uh, with guests from the UGM about the application of my year. Uh, until until maybe, maybe uh, about, about 10 a.m. or 11. And, and as, as participants, you, you, you will be free to ask the question as, as many as, many as possible. possible. Share your, Share your thoughts, thoughts and ideas in a Q&A session. session. And don't, and don't hesitate, hesitate to raise your, raise your hand if you want to ask something. something. Okay. okay. And don't and forget, don't forget don't to take the next one and bring the new insights you as your so many. And, and uh, without further ado, ado, please, please join, join me in welcoming the from Professor Gomez and Tom Sears, Professor. Hmm? Hello, Tom Sears. Sorry. I don't know. 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 あ、じゃあダメだ。ああ、そっか。ああ、あれすいません、きんらぎ。インターネット待ち。ビッチアイディアあるすいません、きんらぎ。Nine one eight nine six nine six six seven. Don't you know? It, it doesn't like me to use the other. It's asking me to, to close the meeting all the time. What connection do you use? I use the, it looks like the connection is okay. It's just like, oh, zoom. yeah, the zoom is a bit problematic. Let me share my screen and we'll do as though everything was fine. Let's see, I will just put these windows down. Okay, you want me to show you presentation from my country? No, it's okay. Okay. So for those of you who didn't come this week, I'm going to go very quickly over what we did with the students. Oh, good morning. Ah. Very good. So we talked about the structure. Maybe I should go in the slideshow. We talked with the students about the structure. Oh, let me close that as well, it's a pain. About the structure of point cloud, what they are made of. Then I did show looks like, and when you zoom that you really have points, and then each point have different attributes based on what they have. Lumas. No, she has screen over there. Must have seen. Okay, perfect. And then I explain the concept behind the lidar. So the intensity being the energy. I'm not quite sure the students really understand the really appreciated this. They are divided by the distance and the surface the laser is going to impact. So you have, with the distance, the differentiation. So it's not the same distance with everything. Then I explain what are the number of returns and how you're going to differentiate the returns in LiDAR data. Then I did show what are the main uh, type of um, data structure that we can use. 
at least for geographies, there are other type of data. But I give it a five minutes break. Then I explain the different way of collecting data from laser scanning to SFM for us would be this, this here. Do you know what is SLAM, the newcomers from UGEM? What is SLAM? Have you heard of it before? So SLAM, I couldn't quite remember the, what it stands for, before, but it's simultaneous a laser and, uh, not laser, something and mapping. Up oh, here, SLAM, SLAM no L or non data KL. Laser? Le laser, can I? Maybe laser, I'm not quite sure. The way it works, it's a bit different from the other techniques. It combines both almost FM and LIDAR. So you know when you have a LIDAR point cloud or a LIDAR uh, sensor, you don't need to know exactly where you are to use this data set, right? Because if your sensor moves like crazy, the point you're going to get are not very accurate. But SLAM doesn't use any uh, GPS or localization device. The way it works, it's going to take photograph like continuously. And when the sensor moves, it's going to detect through the photograph the change of motion, the change of location. It's going to use that almost like SFM. So you use SFM to place the camera so it knows that the camera is moving. And then on top of it, it's going to use uh, the LiDAR data, the point cloud, to then construct the environment. Very useful if you work in a cave, for instance. Cave, no GPS, very hard to get information out. You can just walk with it and get the data set. In Japan, we use it a lot in forest environments. When you are in, under like canopy, let's say if you go to Borneo, Borneo, your laser, even the best laser doesn't go through the trees, no chance. You can walk with it, no GPS data, and you can still reconstruct your environment in 3D. Very powerful. It uses the accelerator, accelerometer inside the system, plus the camera, plus the laser. Easy, actually it's quite easy. Then I explain about the different sensors. So you guys, I guess, know all of this. Uh, LiDAR sensor, TLS, and on UAV. Then uh, stations that are like a combination, like total station that can do scanning. So the Leica MS60 is one of them. So you can do both together. And then I explain also how SFM work, uh, especially the SIFT algorithm and how you detect different elements into photograph. For those of you who didn't come, if there is anything you don't understand, you don't know what is the SIFT algorithm, I think that it's the chance you can ask me. I'm happy to pause and explain later. And then I did show some of the possibility at first when I, one of the first paper I wrote in Japan, this is 2013 on SFM, I was showing that you can go back in history. So this one is from historical photograph, 1970s in Japan. 1970s, you have the geomorphology, you don't have 3D point cloud, you don't have the EM, and you don't have a good computer to process any of that. But using archive, even paper archive, you can use paper archive and then recreate the three time. So for play Asia, where the geomorphology, vegetation goes very fast, building change very fast, it can be a very good way to look at how things move and are modified over time, if you have the archives, of course. Then one of the things I was showing in that paper is that you can even measure trees. So at the edge, we have some information of the tree and the vegetation height in different places. That can be quite interesting. And Japan being like very much Indonesia with a lot of active volcanoes. So we have 1966. and 2006. 1966, 1996, no good quality data in terms of geomorphology at that time. You can still reconstruct all of that and go back in time. It's like almost a time winding machine in some ways. Like data you were not able to construct in the past, you can re rebuild now. I think it's, this is more important eventually, even than uh, using a UAV or a drone today. Because data that were lost can be actually given a new life. And that was the conclusion for lecture one. But that was for the students, so we took an hour to explain all of that. Then lecture two, what did I talk about? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, then I explain, let me go about this. Then I explain in lecture two, SFMMVS and how you can actually use it in different environments with all the different difficulties and the different, uh, what? And the different senses you must be using in different type of environments. So I give to Masamim the presentation. So if you guys want to have it as well, you can just ask him. So just going through this, different the coast, like for instance, when you're a geography student, think about the cliff, what is the best way to get your data? Otherwise, you don't get the face of the cliff if you're flying on top. It's better to have a TLS or like some ground data. I was explaining that you can go through the water as well, like up to four meters here at sea when the water is very clear. So you can see inside the water and you can reconstruct inside the water. So in Indonesia, it's very difficult because the water is very murky most of the time. So in that case, you won't see anything. If you're using SFM, you can reconstruct what you can see. What you can't see, you can't reconstruct. And then I was giving some example for volcanoes. Um, this is the dome of Volk Unzen Volcano, where Daika Erikto is working for his master as well. And then you can also work at the scale. And I think that was the conclusion of this. And then lecture three, I think, was uh, practical on SFM, so I'm not going to get there. And today I want to talk about the workshop about LiDAR data processing from points to the world. So the idea is that you guys are geographers. Anyone who's not a geographer here, not doing geography or geology, geoscience, anyone? In the newcomers, you guys are geography, geogra, geo something? No? So what's your specialty? Agriculture. Oh, close enough. Okay, fast. And what about this too? Agriculture? Or oh, geography, geography. Okay, so you're the only one who's like Pajuna. Maybe he likes you more. Good for you. So what I want to do today is for you to do the things that we are doing in them so you know how to process it. So, Bahamim, did you share the software and everything already? So make sure that you install Cloud Compare and make sure that you have downloaded the data. <clears throat> and once you're all ready, then we will start. Yes, it no. Misery, eh? あ、
Okay. A student was telling me that the L in SLAM is localization, not laser localization. It's localization and mapping. But to, it's there, it can be anything. As camera and scanner. So the the scan inside most of the scanner, you have also an IMU. So you know it's going up or down, left or right. And on top of that, you have then a camera, which tells you actually what how your is moving. Let's say if I'm away from, I'm going to see you smaller, right? If I get closer, you're going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. So I know that I'm moving forward. Then SLAM is using the laser. Let's say my pixel camera, you all look like pixel in 2D. But there is a laser uh, that goes against you and reflect back, right? So I know that your face is like three meters away. And I know that your face on the camera is okay at this position. So when I move, the camera tells me, or oh, you move closer. And I get the same object in this camera, your face in this photo, and your face in this photo. And when I hit your face, uh, sorry, I hit the, no, you're close on it. Uh, let's say your computer. I hit your computer with the laser. I can recognize that I'm hitting the same surface with the photograph. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because you're not using slam technology. It's a different technology altogether. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So most LiDAR also have a camera, but the slam processing is it's like applying SFM to LiDAR, combining SFM and VS, finding, you know what's showing the system algorithm? System, you know what it is? It's invariant. Transform. So, here, I take a photograph of four of you. I'm going to see you like this. This is the four of you. Then if I get closer, you're going to look like this. Then the problem is like, how does the computer know that this, because you're closer, so you look different, your features will be clearer here than are far away. So it's hard to get you two together. So what the shift algorithm will do is to decompose this. Into different level of accuracy during the DPI level. Same for Sense? So, at this, at this level, you're going to look like a blurb which is here. And at this level, like a blurb which is here. And it looks still. This level, you're going to look like a blurb like this. Then at this level, this. then at this level, something. And then what it's going to do is going to match at multiple scale. It's going to say, what is the chances? This is the same than this. And what will it will do at the same time? It's going to cre create a matrix. Um, it's going to do two things. First, Are, are closed and it's white background. So it's going to have a vector, a long vector, which means a lot of change in the span of colors. From, let's say, black, your shadow is black. 
down to white wall at the back. And same is going to create it here. Yeah. 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 And to do is going to rotate the matrix to match those orientation factors. Another, you have a clear, this and here, you have a clear change of direction. So the border being here, the vector goes into direction. Okay? So, when I'm away, maybe I cannot tell you have hijab, but when I'm also, then I can tell. The computer is head maybe moving, right? It's going to rotate. This vector until it matches one. So if you do it for one thing, you cannot find what is what. But in every picture, you have many, many different elements, right? So what you have to do is to match thousands of different elements. So the computer knows that in that scene, you have a set of elements. They get closer. The same elements are now in different places. Right? Because in the scale, it knows whether I'm closer or fast, far, further away. It can tell whether it's the same thing from far or from close. This is SFMMBS. Now what they do is they use that with the LiDAR. By using this in real time, they know how I have moved. They recognize things. Well, I hit this time with the LiDAR. Then I know it's you here. And when I move again here, and that LiDAR point cloud is going to map you here, I know it's you. I can project this location, you, on the LiDAR itself, and I know the LiDAR is moving in the same Reconstruct your things really. Very good. And much cheaper than TLS. TLS, buying TLS, very expensive. I have a peak of mine who's even making some. In so that's what new technology. Okay, everyone has Masukaja. Who has the software? People from UMS. Software install. Data. So let me ask you a few questions first. What is the LiDAR point cloud? What is the LiDAR point cloud? Geomorphology and land use planning. <laughs> what is a LiDAR point cloud? What is it made of? Well, it's a set of points, right? It's a lot, a lot of points over there. And what, what are the difficulties to work with point cloud? Do you have any idea? What are the difficulties to work with point cloud? When you have a... Yeah, the number of points, right? A lot of points. What else? So you have a large data set. What else can be a difficulty? I'm sorry? Yeah, the quality, of course. For any data, quality can be an issue. And it's really hard to assess the quality of LiDAR point cloud because most of the time we think that LiDAR is bad. So, state the quality, the accuracy. Really hard, right? What else? Yes. So when you work with data that are derivative from the point cloud, very often you are given, let's say, the DN or the DTN. And you don't know whether it was good adaptation or better this one, and you have to just to take the data. What else? Anything else? You just arrive. <laughs> <laughs> you just arrive, and I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> not, not a good day today. <laughs> 
So what are the difficulties to work with point cloud? What do you think are the difficulties? Well, the other thing is like you're looking at the discrete, a truly discrete data set. When you have been doing like a lot of GIS and you have a grid, even if the data is discrete, you don't have gaps in between. You assume that the data are all next to one another. But in the point cloud, it's not the case, right? And you have different densities. So you have different level of discretization in space. Can you imagine a physics model that would run some places, uh, it happened actually, but some places sometimes it runs at certain definition and then certain times at other definition and you have no control over it. That can be another difficulty. What are the good points of working with LIDAR? If I'm telling you, oh, this is just so bad, then why doing it? No point, just get rid of it. What is good about LIDAR on cloud? What what can you do with it that you couldn't do without? Yes, this is one possibility, absolutely, because the LIDAR goes through most of the vegetation. Then you can define what is ground from what is like the vegetation. Although we're going to see in a second, it can be difficult. Ah, Zoom, Zoom doesn't like me again. You are low on something. I don't know what he's saying. Yeah, Masimati. Yeah, Masamim. Yeah. So I would like to do this, but let, let's wait for a second. So what else is something which is positive for using point cloud technology? Those who came from UGM, you came all the way here. Tell me why it's important to work with point cloud technology. What difference does it make? Accuracy. Yes, you can. You can also get the data very quickly. You need to be walking through the woods with your stick or anything. So like the, it's fast. It also allows you to work like when it's steep like this. I don't want to be climbing on the steep wall. Then it can work also quite easy. And then, and then you also have a lot of different actually, like you know, with sensing, when you have different bands, then it works the same way. You have the like return number, the maximum number of return for a given square or for a given pulse. You have one pulse that comes out and it tells you how many returns that pulse created at one location. You also know the swath direction. So let's say you fly in the center. Oh, let's say I fly here and my swath is like this. I'm going to see you this way through, right? So let's say you are under a tree and I fly over your head. When I'm over you, I'm not going to see it. And at the same time, the LiDAR is going to have like a few reflections first before getting you. So I lose a lot of energy before even finding you. But if you use the data from the swath, let's say you want only you the angle that are like 30 degrees above or anything, you can say, just classify the point 30 degrees above on the swath. So I'm going to only the band that are side. So not when I'm on top of you, but when I'm here, if it's a tree, there is only a, a trunk and then a canopy, right? So I'm going to be able to see you more easily from the side than from the top. So when you get data in Bonpom, for instance, it's most likely that the provider will only use the best theoretical data, which is from top, because it's the shortest. And in supposedly, that's where you have the most energy remaining. 
but in very densely forested area, or let's say you have in so, you have, I don't know some kind of vegetation crops or whatever, you can't really hard to go through. So sometimes sideways is better. In Japan, when we have uh, forestry tree plantation, actually sideways get way better results than on top. That's why I'm talking about the angle of the lidar. Which has got it, 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 it. There is a, a mirror inside, and that's the angle you mentioned, right? That's what you mean? So you can do classification by group and see actually which one works well. Because you also have the different paths. So you know if it's path number one, number two, you also have the GPS time. So you know when you start, when you end. So you can say, I want to get to the end when I'm flying here. And I only want to have, let's say, X degrees. Of, so I only see this. And then I get this band at this as well. So you can use that and see if you get better data. You can also correlate load it with your data. Does it match what I get from the top? Do I have ground level, which is lower here, than when I'm looking at it from the top? Because if you lose all your energy there, like through vegetation and whatever, you're not going to see the ground, but you're going to see a layer. You're going to see something which is maybe the top of the lowest vegetation. In which case, it looks like the ground, but it's not. It's the top of the vegetation. So having another place to confirm is good. With that, OK. Thank you. We have a pretty back. Thanks. You know, when I was a student, I used to play with the remote control to have a second one in my class. So the teacher will play something on TV and I will change the channel. And the teacher will like, what? 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 And of course, I would laugh like crazy. Ah, these old people, they cannot use technology. Now it's my turn. Like, it doesn't work. I have to ask you, please help me because I don't know how to do it. So now I know how she was feeling at that time. Yeah, I was a very bad student. Yeah, Nakal Skari, when I was young. Okay. So I was talking to you about the different elements that you have in your point cloud. And we will use actually those attributes, the different attributes, to make a classification like we do in remote sensing. So this is an example of being extracted from return intensity. But if you look at the remaining points, you can see that we have actually vegetation remaining here. So for that we and then, what in that case I think I did was to map a plane through the lowest point. So still I have noise on top. And then I ask, I call that plane into another set of like random points. And I did point to point distance. So anything that was too high or too far away from that plane, I knew that it was vegetation or something different. And then I could get rid of it. This works well near a river or in a quite flat land where it's like the most simple case. When you start to have like complex geomorphology, it needs a bit more time and a bit more uh, different approaches. But in general, when you have your point cloud, the way you can look at it, the point cloud is going to be a sum, like a group of X, Y, Z, where it is, and then different type of attributes. And this is a screenshot from the software we're going to use in a second, where you can see intensity, return number, number of returns, sky and direction flag, edge of flight line, classification. So this one is because the point cloud has been classified already. Synthetic flag, key point flag, white tail flag, scal angle rank, so you can rank your different angles. You, you don't always have all of this. Then some extra user data that I created at that time, the ID and the GPS time. So those are some very standards, like a band in remote sensing that you can use for each single point. This being said, when you're going to have your point cloud, your raw point cloud, let's say it has been transformed from angular coordinates to an XYZ data set that you can use. In that case, you still might have errors. 
Every single point is not a point. Every single point doesn't record all the things uh, perfectly. You often have NAN data. There is a return somehow, but there is a glitch. When you collect, I don't know, a million points every minute or every 30 seconds, this computer also can have glitch. Communication can have glitch. Very often when you have a drone-based LiDAR, it has to talk to the GPS, it has to talk to the IMU, and it has to talk to the ground GPS as well. And your satellite still needs to be in good position. A lot of lemon that you're lining with. You know what this means, lining lens in English? You say also lining up lemons. We have heard that before. To line up lemons. Lemons. Uh, a lemon for us is something that's really very sour, hard to put in your mouth, like not very sweet, right? Not very nice. So when you line up lemon, it means that it's a lot of problem that you can have. So when you have so many lemons, you can have actually each of these your data sets. So very often, one thing you want to do is also to check your data set. So in the, so the programming software I'm using, I'm not going to talk to you about it today because it's too many things, but you can do that. You can run actual data check just by one command line, very easy. And it's going to tell you whether there are errors in your data set. If you guys are interested, you can ask Pat Junoon and I can tell him how to do it. And then your data set is going to look like this. What do you think this is? Mr. Geopolitik, what do you think this is? Or Geopolitik is this? What is this? <laughs> Metul, colorful. But why colorful? Rainbow, yeah, very nice. Okay, we all know it. Let's go home. Rainbow. That was the solution for today. So those are the different paths of your LiDAR. The LiDAR is moving here, then back, then down. So this is the pathway, the direction of the LiDAR. And each time you have a swath, this is the swath of the We're looking at it from top, and the LiDAR is taking data like this. Then moving, then taking data. Oh. No. And you can see you have an overlapping layer, right? This is overlapping. So that's how you construct your point cloud. You have series of swaths. You have series. So let me explain, just in case. You have your plane or your, your plane. With the LiDAR underneath. And the LiDAR is moving left to right. So you get light laser coming in and out, and in and out, and in and out, in and out. Laser coming in, reflecting the ground, and back. Here you have a tree, laser coming in, and then reflecting the ground and coming back. So you have a swath like this, right? So the plane is going forward, and inside here, you have a triangular mirror. This is a mirror. The laser shoot at it. The male mirror is rotating and it's creating this. In the TLS, when you have a T terrestrial laser scanner, you have something that looks like this on the tripod. You have a base which is going to rotate this way. This way, okay? And then you have inside this mirror, 
but it's rotating this way, up and down. So while it's moving this way, it's taking the mirror is moving this way. Okay? And then if I shoot the laser, the laser is going to go bing, 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 okay? And then this creates your point cloud. The plane doesn't have the second mirror, it only has one rotation, but it moves. And while it moves, it gets blue swap. And then it's going to break. It doesn't break, the plane doesn't break. It's going to turn. Then take again the data and another swap. And what you can see is this. From top, the plane went this way, took data here, then back, then back, and forth, and back, like this. Very important, because I'm not going to use that on your smart screen. Here, you have data from both sides. And that can be very useful. When you look at your data set, here, you have a laser coming from only one side. But in the middle here, you know that you have two. So someone was asking me, yeah, we don't know sometimes, not so many points, not so this. You said so, right? Correct. And when you want to work on it, why you have denser points in some places, which one you can trust more? Then you can use this and actually the, the original map. You can ask the computer, get me the areas where I have more than one swath. Swath one and swath two overlap in the area. And then you get the denser point cloud. Right now, I have a, one of my students from China working on error model on LiDAR. And this is very important because We fly the UAV with the LiDAR in Japan. Centimeters back and forth. 60, 90. Same path. Slower, slower, so that we get more points. We compare the data from one to the other, same place, no change, nothing. In forested environment, what is the error? We compare the difference. What is the difference between the, what do you think is the difference? How much difference? 10 centimeters, five, 20, or two millimeters? How good, you, how good do you think the result compare? What do you think we have? Oh, it's a, it's a specific question because you didn't know, of course. Uh, for forest environment, three meters, three meters difference. Same place, same sensor, same UAV, different flight, three meters era. Now, when we are higher, if we have more bend, this overlap, instead of having a small overlap, we have a lot of overlap, overlap. Era drops almost by a few, uh, we only get to a few centimeters. So the overlapping, very important. The problem is that there is no, there is no model for LiDAR now about errors. People use simple statistical technique like me, RMSC, MAE, and say that's the quality of the LiDAR. But this is wrong. Actually, comparing the same sensors at different heights and different way of actually overlapping the data so that you can get very, very different results. So I was showing you uh, one of the things that I like doing is to go one day to the place, then next year, then next year, and see change in erosion, vegetation change. I have no idea whether what I'm measuring is correct or not. Absolutely no idea. Maybe what I'm measuring is totally wrong. And this I don't know. That's why I've asked this PhD student to work on it, because it's very important. Being able to identify your overlapping zone and within one point cloud data set, being able to compare what happens when you have only one overlap, two, or a lot more. And this overlap, let's say you have from top two band overlapping this way. If you have a topography which is like this, or something which is like this, with trees, again, very different results. 
If you think about SFM or LiDAR data, we all create very nice ground control point, GCP, take a GPS, and then compare, right? This location is OK right here in the sand where I am. What about the change of land, land cover when I'm in the, the, is it the same? Can I just extend it and just do like a linear regression between the two? Everyone does it. Who hasn't done it? Everyone does that. We have ground control points, and then we extend and think, this is the error. The error on top of like, say, a building and the error in the forest will be very, very different. So quality of LiDAR data today is a big problem. So you need to be able to work on it. If we don't resolve this issue, using the LiDAR data for high quality results means nothing because we don't know whether we are imagining things or whether they are real. Uh, this is a complex topic. I can talk about it later if you're interested because I can talk about this like on and on and on and on. Until, until you drop. So before we go further, next we'll be playing with the data. I will also take a break, five minutes, to have my lunch, as he was suggesting that he's sleeping. <laughs> lunch. What can you Yeah. Yeah. Knock, knock, knock. Tidu Raja, yeah? <laughs> so have your for a second. Tabelo? Ah, I don't know. Ah, mot 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 ah, monat. I'm Chris. We didn't meet right yet. What? What's your name? Your student? Masi sorry, sorry. Okay. Good, as, as always. Indonesia tastes good. Can you make coffee? Um, without sugar, yeah? Thank you so much. So they have to come in the day, 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 the When you are so oh. oh sorry, that maybe I'm not good. Oh it keeps open. No, it should be hold on. More later.
Hmm. Tapi bukan asli. Ya, very good. Yeah, Indonesia very good in general. The snack. When I come to the Indonesia, I usually put on weight. No. No, no, no. <laughs> Slide. Oh, um, what does it say? The Zoom are uh, not not disconnected. The live the live feed is because disconnected. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Computer dari Jepang, tidak bisa bahasa Indonesia ya. Okay, I think you are all refreshed and ready to go to the next stage. So, this is the software I asked you to install. It's Cloud Compare. So, Cloud Compare was developed by a French fellow, and French people like their software to be free. Lucky enough. We are not very good at business, but we like to give things away. So this is a free software for cloud, for cloud manipulation. What you can do in it is quite simple, but today, Cloud Compare also has a library in Python, so you can call Cloud Compare straight away in Python and you can program it, which makes it much more powerful and a bit easier to use. Sometimes the GUI can be a bit heavy, but if you use actually the Python programming program version, much faster. Although if you ever work with large point cloud, you might want to work with the open CV, C++, blah, blah. C++ much faster than Python. Who's using C++ here? C++ programming? Oh, Jumadi. Oh, okay. And Python, they may use Python as well. Anyone using Python? Oh, yeah, of course. And R, who's using R here? Okay, so today we're going to use R, oh, so everyone is equal. Nobody knows about it. Very good. So today I want you to also open the workshop data. And in the workshop data, there is something that's called point loss. And we're going to drag this into Cloud Compare. And here we're going to apply all, meaning that we're going to keep the value they are and you're gonna have this second window so what does that do cloud compare is not going to work or process in projected coordinates because it takes more time it's going to first put it down to a zero xyz but it's going to keep the original coordinate 
So it works in a simpler coordinate system. And then when you use your data, it goes back to the original one. And here it's asking you whether you want to do it or not. And you no, know, it's really up to you. But let's say we're going to say yes to all this time. And the transformation which is being applied is explained on top. So this is the explanation of the shifts and the scale change. So scale here will be one, of course. We don't want to make things bigger. And the shifts, this is to shift the original uh, coordinate to something which is going to start at x1, y47, and z7766, which doesn't make sense. Actually, we could keep it like, much simpler. And yes to all. And I open it. I'm sure you have all opened it already. You could do it. Anyone has difficulty opening a file? Raise your hand. Anyone doesn't have a computer and just waiting? Raise your hand. Thank you for the coffee. So that's the Ben Swaff we had a look at earlier. So if you go on top, you can then rotate your 3D and see that the location I've chosen is actually a lake shore with forest. But when you look at it, very ugly, not, not see much. So the first thing I want you to remember is to be able to Put an EDL shading. EDL shading. E is something and DL is dynamic lighting, which means that, yeah, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. It's something. It means that it's rendering real time. Yeah, I'm very bad with remembering orders. You can ask my students, I never know any of that. So you're going to go to display. And when you go to shader, shaders and filters, you're going to have the EDL shader. And here we're going to apply EDL shader. And you're going to see the shades apply to your point cloud. So you can see now better that you have trees in front of you. But it's still not very good. We still have those sense looking at us. So next, you want to modify how your point cloud. Can you do that? All can do this. All good. Oh, um, cloud compare. I gave to Masamim. You should have it already. You missed the fair. Oh, sorry, my, my, my mistake. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Then let, just let's wait. Sorry, sorry. So please download Cloud, Cloud Compare. It's a small software, so it should be very fast. Sorry, sorry. So this is how professors work. They do mistake and then blame the others. You, you're not good. <laughs> <laughs> Cloud compare. Cloud, like a cloud, I want compare. So let me know when you're there. Yeah, I'm among the yeah.
C'est moi sur la data de Cloud Compare, Bloom. OK. Sorry, I should have prepared it first. My, my bad. Because in the room, everyone downloading at the same time, so I'm super slow. <laughs> Ah, mucho. すべてあげるね。もう従業、あの、ね、そうすると、見たければ。He doesn't find it or no, it's different. Do you think I can disconnect? Maybe not good though. Right. Check out the quality of the video. Ah, oh, okay. Still downloading. You have it? Yeah. Two more minutes, okay. No, one hour. Let me see. Maybe I have it. Oh, no, I don't. I don't have cloud compare. Hmm.
Okay, for those of you who are online watching on YouTube, you can. Uh, we are now trying to download, finishing download Cloud Compare, which I didn't provide, which was my mistake. So once it's all done, we'll continue, but just sabar a bit more until everything is done. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, absolutely. There is something which is very important. Work hard and learn mathematics. <laughs> No, uh, they are, it depends what you want to do with it. If you accept that you're going to be an end user, then you don't need all the equation and everything. You can do a lot of things just by point and click in this software. So we're going to learn today how to go from raw point cloud to classification, and then having some level of classification, and then having a DEM and a DTM that you can use in QGS, without touching an equation. So this is possible. Now, if you have difficult point cloud, like this group with uh, Pajunun, they work in a place where you have a lot of landslides, steep slopes, a lot of vegetation. So this needs a bit more work. And then you can do two things. You can work in this software by separating geographically different elements, but it takes a lot of time or you can program it. Then you can ask Pajumadi, who's a specialist, um, where you need then to have a bit of mathematics and a bit of uh, skills in, progr in program. It, it really depends. But not knowing math is not going to stop you in geography. You are not an engineer. You're not here to like, generate new point cloud. Or anything. You're here to use them for geography. So it's a different approach. And Luckily, a lot of software they exist, so you don't need to actually do everything like by hand or by calculation. So your students should be okay. In Oge, in geography, how many credits of mathematics? Two or three, or same. Okay. And in agriculture, a bit more? Okay. So it's very different in Japan. In Japan, they will do mathematics. Uh, even enter master degree, there is a test in mathematics, and you need to be able to do differential equation, a lot of complex. No. So for him to go to master degree, he had to go through interview. And of course, maybe like here, but there is also a series of tests and that can be quite quite high level. So very different. In France, no test where I was, so just keep and proposal and that's all. Shushini, because there is chat GPT. Ah. Chat GPT does everything for you. この間
もう素晴らしすぎてもうびっくりした。もう何でも聞いてもすごく細かい正しい答えが出る。そうそうそう,そう。じゃ、じゅ、自分。そう。everyone ready? sudah, 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 um, belum dapat. Oh, very good. So, once you have it, maybe you can share the software. Once you have downloaded it, you can share. Okay, good. So you're very bad because you're not sharing with UMS. It's on the UDM team. Oh, not good. Tanya, orang gue begini aja sudah di di dapat. Do you have it? Yes, but and if you press on top, where is your mouse? If you press on top and you rotate, you to be able to rotate your pointer. And here on the left, you're going to have the details on your pointer. Okay. 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 は絶対に時間取りで終わらない。もうあともう9時半で何も始めない。今日は10時から。ああ、あんたもうちょっと短くしても大丈夫。Okay. So once you have done it, once you have the software installed, I'm sure most of you have it. Let me check. It's there. It's there. Very good. You're almost there. You're not almost there. You're not almost there either. Actually, people in Ugem they already downloaded it. Maybe you can get it from them, which is tough. You should be sleeping instead of coming here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is to choose on the left side. We're going to choose. So I'm going to show you. You're going to choose your point here, like the cloud. You have to click on it. And once you click on it, you're going to see at the bottom, or at least on my software. Well, here is at the bottom. It can be in other places depending on your computer. You can have the details of the point cloud. So it's going to tell you X, Y, Z, the number of points, 3D view, and then you can change a lot of different display elements. For instance, the point size here, which is default. If you put it to four, you can see that it changed a lot, right? And you can also change the way you display your data. So here there is a series of options. So there is a series of options here. And you can choose how you want to show your data set. Okay? Now you see it's a set of trees. If you look at it from the other side, if you flip it down over, You can see from the bottom that actually in a lot of places where you have trees, you have holes at the bottom. Why is that so? Why do we have holes here? What are those holes about? A lot of holes here. Why? Why do we have holes? Can I buy it? 
Absolutely. So for those who didn't hear. So why do we have a hole? Why do we have holes at the bottom? When you this is the data from the bottom, and you can see that you have holes. Why? Why do we have holes? Maybe then the dense tree, what else? What what is at the location of the trees? What is at the location of the trees? Sorry? No, 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 no. It's a stupid question. At the location of the tree, you have the tree itself. So you have the tree trunk. So you cannot see inside the, the ground, right? So you will see through the tree. For those of you interested in data processing, this is very important. Because it means that if you look at your data set from the bottom, you know exactly what the tree trunks are. And you know when you have like the top of the trees, the canopy, it's so hard to find the top of the tree. Which one is the tree? Really hard. But this one, you can first have an, an idea of how big your tree is. Big hole means big tree, right? There is nothing such a thing like big hole and small tree. Not possible. And then if you want to find the trees, in your data set, you can write a simple program that just locate the holes. And that's it. Okay. So let's look at the data now. And let's change the point ID to intensity. Let's go to intensity. Let's change the display from point source ID to intensity. And if I click on it, this is in black and white, but you can change it to, let's say, a series of colors. Let's say, and here we go. So we have our trees, our vegetation, the ground, with different colors based on the intensity return. What is difficult about this? Can you tell, oh, the ground is this color and the tree is this color or not? Can you use that data like you would in remote sensing and say, tree is that color and ground that color or maybe not? Use a point, or let me just change it. Mm. <laughs> okay, the answer is no, not really. Like, it's not perfect. Yes, to some location, but there are places where the trees and the vegetation will have the same return. So you cannot say vegetation would be intensity from this to this and ground from this to this. It's going to work to a certain extent. It's going to work to a certain level, but you will still have errors we're going to see in a, in a minute. Okay, so... What I'm telling you here is like, there is no silver bullet. It's, you have to work, even without mathematics, you still have to do a lot of work. So, to do classification, different strategies. You can start and apply different ways. Today I'm going to only, I'm, oh, let's say, I'm not going to touch anything about object-based classification. Object base is going to look at the structure of your point cloud, the density, its organization, 
that's a bit more advanced. Today, we're going to stay very, very a simple way of, of classification, of doing classification. This being said, the second part, when we use R, I'm going to show you elements that are close to that. So, like Mas Hamim was saying, if you have a student who doesn't want to do any uh, kind of mathematics or anything like this, or even programming whatsoever, then you can play with the color. So look at what I'm showing you here on the left. When you go to your software, you can see that you have a display from blue for me to yellow and red. And what you want to be able to do is to see whether you can actually map different elements. And for that, you can use actually that white ball here. So you're going to gray elements within a certain band. So you can divide them visually without touching an equation, without touching programming. And you can do it on the left, and you can do it on the right. So it doesn't work. OK, like this. You can also change the way you display your data by using the arrow at the top that has a color. And you can move the blue towards the center. So you see here I'm seeing, oh, actually the blue is, most, is going to be mostly the trees. So there is still a lot of green in there, but the blue, definitely the trees. So what I can do is to then grab that element and say, OK, all of these are the trees. And then once on that, what you want to do is to separate your point cloud. You want to classify your point cloud. And what you have declared being trees and what you have declared not being trees. And to do that, you're going to go to this button here, min max. Can you see min max? You click on it. And look at the range that you're going to have. The range is the range that you have chosen here. You see that range here? 114, 225. This is exactly what's coming out here. So the way it works, if you want to do it visually, you play with this, with the range in here. And then once you have something that you think is OK, then you can just click that button and split. Do not export, split. Because export is going to delete the data you don't want. Split is going to keep the two so that you can continue working on your subset. And you can work again and again. Then we're going to split. And you see from the original Pond Cloud now, we have two subsets. So if I remove the first subset, you see this is the, the vegetation with some points on the ground. And this is supposed to be no vegetation, but still not. Can you all do, all do that? I will give you a minute for that. For the workshop at 10, it can be a bit shorter. So we can take a bit more time on this. And then the second part of the workshop, we 30 minutes should be enough, actually. Today, what time do you have, all have to go for Solat? Sorry, Jambelape. 11.15. OK. So we'll do maybe a break 10, and then uh, until 11.10, something like this.
ちがいいアプリを作るそう。普通に。普通に測れる。うん。そう。Let's say If I do use this, I will use that tool here. And let me zoom a bit. And it's not the best way of doing it. Hold on a second. Okay. So imagine I want to measure a tree. I'm going to get this tool here. And I'm going to go at the top. Go away. And the bottom. Length, distance, 53. But it's in an inch. That's the problem. It's in the US, so it's not in meters, but you measure the, the height. You can measure areas. OK, there is someone who asked me a question. You can measure anything in the point cloud. So, one thing, this point cloud is in the US, so it's not in meters, it's in inch. So, it's going to look weird, but we don't care, it doesn't matter. So, one thing you can do is to measure the length, but also localization of different points. So, what I was showing is that when you have a tree, you can go and use this tool here, the one on the left. Just click on it, you choose. Let's say the top of the tree. I'm just doing it. And then you're going to choose, it gives you the XYZ values. And then you're going to measure the base. Oh, if you use that tool here, this is going to be the distance from the top to the base. And it's 59 inches. Okay? So you can measure anything in your point cloud. You can also measure, areas. let's say, if I use the third tool here. And I use this point, this point, and this point. This is going to tell me the area. And it's not the area like in GIS, which is vertical and flat. It's on the point cloud. So you have actually the real area of the lens. And then for people like who loves doing things by hand, you can also cut manually. If it's just a pain in the ass to just go and play and it's easy, you can use the button here. You see the scissors? There is a scissors button which is in Cloud Compare. So you choose your cloud. There is a scissors button here. You can use that to cut things. Now let's say I want to cut the trees above a certain height. Can you get rid of this? I don't know which one I want to cut. And I'm going to use the scissors. And I have this. So it's going to ask me, how do you want to cut? So you could use a rectangular or a polygon. Polygon is the easiest. I see I can choose from this point to this point by just clicking on it to this point. And then at the end, you right click, right click on your computer. And then cut, you just can extract it. And then you have cut your point cloud. Segmented with, without. You see, you can cut it very easily. Not my favorite version, but when you have a small surface and you want to get rid of some noise, you can just circle it and get rid of it. Most likely, 
whatever algorithm you're going to use, you might still have some remaining in the data set. And writing a function just to, for a few points might not be the best way to approach it, unless you have a very large data set. And doing some manual cutting can be also useful. So, and you see here, we still have some points remaining on the ground, right? Then another way to get rid of points, it's going to be using the SQR. So let me check if I'm in the right order. Yes, I am. It's the statistical outlier removal. So you click on that button. Once you have chosen your, your point cloud, so you choose your point cloud first, the one you want to work on. You choose SQR. And it's going to tell you, you see, you have the, ah, the mathematics. You have a small equation at the bottom. Maximum distance equal average distance by n sigma by the standard deviation. And here you get the number of points to use and the standard deviation you want to work with. Let's say if I want to have work with a, maybe too low, um, 0 0.7 standard deviation. And anything which is beyond this is going to get removed. So I click OK. And it's going to clean the points that are separate from the other. So let's say if you have a noisy point cloud with things that are flying around and they are not connected or close to a lot of points, you can get rid of them this way. So obviously here, that was not the best uh, parameters because I removed a lot of the ground. But the ground actually looks much flatter now. There is still a bit of error here and a bit of error here. If I zoom on it, you see these ones still there. So one of the danger you use that. Or can you do it? Is it working? Can you all do it? Can you all do that already? Can you all do that? Yes? No? Yes? OK. So I was going to tell you the risk with this method is what, yeah, if, I'm not going to tell you. What is the risk with this method? What can be the problem if you do that successively? It's removing the points which have, which have less nearer, nearest neighbors, meaning that what's happening to your data set? Well, on the outside, there are less neighbors. So it's going to eat your points everywhere you have a hole in your data set. That hole is going to be becoming bigger and bigger. So to avoid this kind of problem, one thing you want to do is to recognize the areas where you have issues. Let's say for us, it's here and here. And we want to separate them. And for that, we're going to use the scissors again. We're going to go for scissors. We're going to say, you see this nice area here? I don't want to get rid of it. I want to make sure I keep this data. So I'm going to get rid, take it out. We're going to segment that out. So this data remains. Let me see. I made a mistake, I think. I segmented out the wrong, no. Okay, so that you only keep the areas, think there are errors, and then you can work on those. Otherwise, you're going to get rid of your good data. So you don't want to get rid of those good data, you want to keep them. Betul? Okay, it's going to be 10. So I will give you five minutes break again, and then we will continue. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them.
ちょ、ちょけ。ちょけてよい。あ、ダメだ。You the center point of it, right? You just take the mean of the x, y, and you need the center of the tree. Make sense? <laughs> if you have, oh, if you have to n, and if you have your p, n, i, x, I said, if you from that do the sum over x, y, and z, what is it going to give you? Yeah, and it's going to give you one coordinate, right? And that one coordinate will be the center. If you have point like this on the side of the tree, if you do that, You're going to get the center, right? Like an average to the center. If you have the average of center, then you measure the distance d here, and then you query your point cloud, like all the e n x y z, whether it's equal to, let's get this one p0, p0 to all the pi from i equal one to n in terms of coordinate. So the n of d, and you're going to compare the di to the ideal d, di to the ideal d for x, y, z. The tool. So once you have this, you can say, this tree, those points are tree diameter. With, let's say, you want to have the d minus di for each of uh, a percentage confidence in interval d, percentage of d of 10% or 8%. And you can say that with a 10% confidence interval, you know that this, this is a tree, or 8%, this is a tree. And if you raise this, you're gonna have more and more points, so you might have error as well, but it's gonna be easier to find the tree. It, it's, it's very simple. You, you ask Padumadi, 10 minutes, you can program something. So yes, you can measure the tree diameter. It's something I did with SFM as well. With SFM MBS, we took a series of points. I went around the tree, a series of photographs. So we have points. I use that to find the tree center. And then I measure the D, the change of D. This D here and D here, D1, D2, D3, is going to be different, right, Beda, yeah? So that, let's say, you're on a slope, and you have a landslide. The tree here doesn't want to die. The tree wants to live. So it's going to create strong roots here, so that the tree diameter is going to go this way. It's going to go from here to this, because the roots are being created here, you have more wood which is being created here. The tool, when you have a landslide, the tree is going to actually start dying or slide down, right? The tree is like you and me, doesn't want to die, only leave. 
So what they do is like they create more woods, more tree roots to stop itself from, from sliding, which means that here you have more tree, more woods than on this. So it, it's, it's too much. But the shape of the tree is going to be more like this. So I wrote the paper on that, where I explained that in area where you have landslide, if you work on the shape of the tree trunk, you can work actually on the landslides, whether this slope is sliding or not, whether the tree feels that it needs to create more wood or not. It's a balancing act. It's difficult because sometimes you don't have a slide, but it's very steep, so the tree still needs to do that. So it's not sliding, but the tree wants to stay uh, more or less straight. So you have those issues. So yes, you can do that. And as I tell my students, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Easy. Carlos Saya Vista, c'est moi Vista, Yes. Um, so I got the I have to make Yes. So can we do like the... Uh, Interpolation? Yeah, it's yes, it's coming like afterwards, but we'll do it. Yes, very good question. Yeah, you, you don't want to leave the holes, yes. So did, did you listen to what I was saying about trees? Maybe very important for you. In the tree trunk, like when you have a landslide, the tree wants to live. So it, the way it's going to create wood, or it's going to create actually tree roots that stop the tree from falling, right? So the meter is not going to be perfectly round. It's going to be elongated, because in downstream part, it's going to be stronger. And it means that in the part that goes up on the tree trunk, you're going to have more woods. And the tree trunk tends to be more elongated. You can calculate that from the LiDAR data. So I did it from SFM and LiDAR in Japan, area where I know I have landslide. It works rather well. So, and finding the diameter is easy, right? So if you can identify trees that you know are sliding, you can look at it. And then there is another part, which may be a bit far away from your interest. You can, when the bark is not slick, you can use the tree bark to know whether the tree is still sliding today or not. So the bark is growing based on where the wood is being created. So well, maybe, maybe it's not interesting. But the... OK, for those who are interested in trees, Another thing that can be of interest. You have two types of trees, right? You have trees that have a slick bark and trees that have a bark. You know what is the bark of the tree? Masamim, do you know what is the bark of the tree? No, you don't. Do you know what is the, do you know what is the bark of the tree? The bark of the tree. Indeed. So the bark of the tree is the outside of you have a tree and you look at the tree trunk. The bark is the kulit outside. This is the tree bark. And you have two types of bark. Those that are very slick, lurus, and those that are very rough, right? I'm interested in those that are very rough. How can we know?
This is new. I only made one presentation with that. I never published, so I never told anyone yet. So this is my theory. When you have a tree, the tree from the inside is growing up. Meaning that the kuditya become here. Better? So if you zoom on this, you're going to have three layers. The outside layer here is very old, and this is very new. Then, as a geomorphologist, as a geographer, you're interested in that line here. Why? Remember what I was telling you about the tree growth and roots? When you have a landslide going this way, the tree is going to grow this way. Okay? Create more wood here, a lot more wood. To avoid moving. It means that here, it creates more bark. So the angle here is going to be different from the angle here. So you can, and when you look at this tree bark here, let's say you have something which is like this, and then like this. You have a period of slow or rapid growth here. Is it slow or rapid? We say rapid. We say slow. We say, I don't know. This one, slow growth. This one, rapid growth. Because every year, the amount of bark that was covered the previous year is very, very small. So the, the, the tree from this to this, the length of the bark has changed a lot, right? When you have your tree which is round like this, if you open your tree, if you open this as a line, this is year one, year two, year three, betul? So if change of length here, D, L, D, T, the change of year length per year is important higher. It means that the tree goes very fast. And when you compare this angle here, you know that you have a period where, oh, the tree is growing maybe the same everywhere, no landslide. And then all of a sudden here, it starts to slide. From the tree bark, you can tell whether the landslide has been occurring for a long time or if it's very new, just from the tree. Why is it important? Because the other way to know that is to call the tree. You call the tree and you take the call. Take a lot of time. It's very damageable for some trees. No, not always so good. If you have a bark which is rough, you can work with it. And that can be very important to understand the dynamic of your landslide. Is it always moving as it stops? The good thing is like you can measure it, but you can talk to the local. You go to the talk to the local, you explain to them, look at the bark, touch the bark. Is it changing? And people will know. They will know, oh, this is moving. This is not moving. Okay? So this is simple knowledge that can be passed on. It's difficult in Indonesia, more than in Japan, because the tree bark for a lot of trees, lurus karia, a lot of very, very lurus. So you need to find trees that are those kind of barks. So tree shape, bark change, gives you information about um, the dynamic of the environment. How do you say bark in, the, in Bahasa, the bark of the tree? Okay, very good. No, that was easy. Okay, let's continue.
Let's look at another classification option. I will go back to the holes at the end. There is another way to work on classification. It's going to be not starting with the intensity, but to separate your point cloud first with the number of return. Number of return is going to tell you whether you have vegetation or not. Because houses, people, we are not transparent. So it's only one return. It's only vegetation that gives several returns. So one thing you can do is to filter by value from 1 to 1.5. 1.5 doesn't exist, but it's 1 and everything else. So everything that does more than one return will have vegetation for sure. It doesn't mean that you don't have vegetation with one return. You have dense vegetation that absorbs all the energy of the laser and you don't get any, any energy back. So you still have trees, oh, you still have trees with a one. So I invite you now to have a look at Part compare and go and find where is the number of return. Actually, you should know already. It's almost there where you found the intensity. Okay, so when you look at the number of returns, you can see that you have a lot of value from one to four. And on the ground, you will only have one values. So in that case here, it looks like it's rather a powerful way of using the number of return as a classification. But you still have trivia afterwards on it. So maybe we don't have enough time to do all of it. But once you have done that, you can go back to your intensity and play with the intensity to change this. So I invite you to have a look at the PowerPoint later on about it. So I could go to the end, actually. Hold on. So that's the place where I close the holes, Pajamadi. But okay. So you can play with all different elements into uh, Cloud Compare. Now I'm going to show you how to do it in um, R and R Studio Studio using the LiDAR library, which is here. Lead R. You just have to install package Lead R. And it's going to ask you to install some extra package depending on the type of processing you do. But it's very much the same. And reading a point cloud is very easy. You just go for LAS, read LAS, and points, like the name of my file here is points LAS. So you just read it. And this one is 
familiar with um, command lines? Is anyone familiar with command line? Yeah, you have done it before. All good. Okay, so when you open R Studio, it's going to look like this. Let me see. Okay, yeah. So this is R Studio running, and R Studio looks looks very much like um, any MATLAB type of environment where you're going to have your variable here in the environment, the data you create, the data you import. And this is the place where you're working. So here you're going to decide, you're going to go, let's say we're on desktop, and I'm going to go, man, uh, point cloud technology to the workshop data. And what I'm going to do is to go to more, and I'm going to set this up as the working directory. So you have the command line here at the bottom, but it tells me now that I'm working in that directory, and do the files that I have in that directory. So if I start the LiDAR library, hopefully it works. This computer is not very fast. Oh, six thread again. Ah. So my computer is not very powerful, and I get problem when I run other things at the same time. So let me see if I can close Cloud Compare. OK. So if you run Cloud Compare at the same time, yeah, OK. If you run Cloud Compare at the same time, computer, which is not very, very powerful like mine, it might run an error. But here we go. If you close it, it works. And then what we're going to do is to read the point cloud. So last, read point last. Bless you. We're just going to copy it. And this is going to open here an instance of the file, where inside you have all the different data. And you see there is a dollar sign. So when you're going to query your data set, if I go to, let's say, last, if I, and you press a dollar, it's going to tell you which value, that you, which data that you have. OK? So you enter the name of your variable with a dollar, and it's going to be able to go one level down into the data set. And the same way you can then plot your data, and it's very easy, you just go for plot last. It's going to open a new window, which is a 3D environment, and you can also move in 3D the same way. You can zoom on it, like earlier. OK? So very similar. And once that, if you print last, you're going to have the same information on the size of your PowerPoint, the extent of the X, Y, Z. Anyone okay? Masamim, you are looking at me with a, a worried eye. Okay, good. <laughs> so if you plot the data, plot last. That's how it looks like. So on the PowerPoint, I gave it to Masamim or Paramim. You have all these different functions easy. So why do we get there? because there are powerful algorithms to do the classification. You don't have to do it by hand like earlier. So the first algorithm to introduce you is this one here, the PMF algorithm. 
So if you go for the way it works, this is your original point cloud here on the left. It's going to open the point cloud and look at from the bottom at all the points that are located at the bottom. And then it's going to compare and remove the points based on the threshold. And then repeat and repeat and repeat until the compared point cloud is always the same. So it knows that there is no point underneath anymore. And it's going to say this must be the base of the point cloud. Because in Z, you don't have any point anymore. And this is the code, very easy. Here, there is the original data set already contains blah, 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 blah. I kept this. This is an error because the data set I gave you is already classified. There is already a ground data. So it's going to erase the original ground data to create a new one. I'm going to try to see if I can run that quickly. I'm not quite sure. Okay, and then I just have to plot and plot it with the white background. If it let me plot it, yes, no, no. Here it is. So you see much better results. The trees and the ground clearly separated just by one click. So GUI, very easy to use, but if you can run just a few lines, it's not programming, it's just like writing down like lines, way better results. And this algorithm actually works well, but it's, it's still going to create error. So I'm showing you the result here. You see the data here? The data still have actually trees on it. You cannot see them because they were hidden in the point, but it's not perfect. So better, but not perfect. So for that, there is an algorithm that I like, which is the Wilmington algorithm, which does a very good job at filtering. It's called the cloth-based filtering method. So how does the cloth-based filtering method work? He takes the point cloud upside down. So the bottom is now on top. And it's imagining that you have a cloth of points which falls on top of it. And within a radius of each point of the cloth, it's going to grab the point from the point cloud. So the first one coming are, of course, the ground. And he's going to reiterate that until he gets the best result. This time, so. The algorithm here, easy. Last two, if I ground, last two is because I had a file that was called last two. It's the name of the file, that's all. You just change the algorithm for CSF. Just this, and you get your results. It takes time. On that machine, I ran it last night when I was doing the PowerPoint. It took me about 20 minutes. So unless you want to see 20, wait 20 minutes, let me show you the results. So this is the result. The ground, perfect. So let me see, actually, I think I saved the data yesterday. So maybe I'll be able to import the data set from here. Uh, no, from here. And what, our data? Yes. And if I go and plot. Two. Does it work? No, it's not the one. How do they call it? Oh, yeah, it's the ground. Okay. So I have to run this first, sorry. So once you have run the algorithm, you need to define the ground. So you need to define the ground here first.
And then we're going to plot the ground. And you see the ground still has holes. So that's the question of Professor Jomadi. But it looks like it's pretty slick, right? And if you look in details, it's really looking good. You just have to trust me on that. Usually don't trust people who tell you these kind of things. You know there is something wrong. And what we want to do next is to get the teen data. So we're going to rasterize the DEM. We're going to rasterize the ground. Hopefully it's not going to take too long. OK, it's done. And then to plot the ground, it's a different function because it's a different structure of data. It's not point anymore. It's a thin file. So for that, you use this plot DTM 3D. And this is going to give you that. OK. And you can see you had the road actually in the forest. You can see actually the realm that we couldn't see before. But you can also see that the ground vegetation was not filtered up because we don't have the ground. We actually have the vegetation, the bush on the ground. So it's a DM, but it's a DM with a resolution maybe of the, of the ground cover. So something that you can do next is to remove that based on the roughness. You can see, say, roughness below that threshold is the ground, and so interpolate this data. The thing is that you're going to lose a lot of data in that case. And then if you don't like uh, R at all, and you save your data, so I think it's here, right class, this is going to save your data, then you can go back to Cloud Compare. And let's go back to Cloud Compare. So in Cloud Compare, um, I think it's the process last cycle. Like to all, yes to all. Okay, so that's the the problem, Mister Problem that we had. So you can do a few things when you have this. You can go for Process Cloud. You can go to Edit, mesh, and you can fit. Is it this? No, hold on. There's something else. How do you change it? You have two tools. I forgot. Lupa, there is something in between. When you get old, you oh, mesh de Okay, mesh de Yeah, that's correct. OK, I thought I forgot something. So you go to Edit. You create a mesh from your point, point cloud. So it mesh your data, OK? So it's like uh, Krieging in some ways. And once you have done that, now you have a mesh. But what you want to do is to get points from that mesh. So we're going to, let me check, I forgot. We go to point sampling on mesh. Oh, it's here. Yeah, there is this now blue icon that we didn't have before. You click on it, and it's going to sample point on the mesh. OK. And now what you have is a point cloud that was interpolated also on the mesh, so you don't have holes anymore. And once you have this, then you can go into this button here, the convert button, we can put it like a resolution one ter, direction Z. We're going to upgrade the grid. You have a DEM. And what you can do is you can go for raster, export height. OK. And if you go to desktop, uh, in cloud technology, work data, raster, save. OK, if I was to go to QGIS, yeah, open QGIS.
if it opens, you can then use that raster data as your DM. So you go from point cloud down to the raster data. Now, you see why it's important to know how your DM was made? Because you still have remaining vegetation on the ground. If you ask a company like Majunan to do it for you, they will do two things. They will either go strict on the ground, do a good job, but they will kill the piece that are like the vegetation. So you have a lot of that height vegetation. Maybe it is still important because if you knew the vegetation, let's say you are in location where you have something like this, this vegetation. If you can work on those shapes, then you can extract some values and then calculate a model what the geomorphology should be underneath. This is something which is commonly done in point cloud technology, modeling what the point cloud should be. And very often what you have to do is to go in the field and check how deep actually this is re really is. When there is no data and you want data here, you don't want interpolation here, this is the only way. Get in the field and confirm and create a model. Let's open this. And our DTM should be working, I hope. If I have not made any mistake. Oh, Jelek. So still a lot of holes in my... So this is because my size here might still... You still... This is ugly. So what I want to export is maybe this one. And what you want to do here, we have one meter, is to have like a scale, which is to erase those. So here we choose the minimum. You can also average your data in your, in your values. Also, you see empty cells? I leave empty. So I didn't interpolate when there is no data. So you can interpolate in between the cells to avoid to avoid that where you have you have your DEM, but you still have a lot of holes in your DEM. Now, if you go back to this location and you go back to your process point, hold on a second, process point cloud. There is something important you can do. You see here, you have the population, average height, eight standard deviation. If you do that, and let's say we have a two meters update, it's going to save for each element of your DEM in the grid, how many points you have for each cell. It's going to tell you the population, so how many points in each cell of your DM, the average height, the height standard deviation, minimum height, max height, and height range. Why it's, in, why it's important? Because when you have, let's say, um, a lot of points which are the minimum just at the ground, but you still have one point which is right there, or a series of points which is right there, you might want to know why you have those points there, and whether you have absolutely nothing, or a series of points which are at ground level plus other elements so that you can actually look at the quality of your point cloud, but also the quality of your interpolation. Did you get actually the best data? Do they really make sense? Let's say if you take the average value, what is the minimum and what is the maximum? Do you have an average which is the same everywhere, but in places you have like that much range and in other places you have 10 meters range? That is going to be different even at the one meter scale. So doing this, you just go for raster again. And when you export it, you export all scalar fit. You can also export the density. Go for OK. We're going to click raster 2. And when you go to QGIS, if I open it, open raster 2. On raster two, you see I have different type of data. So if I go to properties, 
I display the data, oh, it's in Japanese, I'm sorry. With single band, gray, you can choose then what you want to display. You see, I have many bands, band one, two, three, it says band, band one, two, three, four, five. So those are the different information that are stored in your data sets. I can't remember which one is which, I still need to look at the manual. But depending on the band, then you have the different like density, height, medium, height, maximum height. So you can compare those. Okay? So please do a better job than do and then I in doing your point cloud classification. This is still a bit ugly. But also you can export your point cloud as a text file or CSV file or last file into QGIS and then interpolate it also in QGIS. It does the same. You can create it into QGIS. And now Daika is going to talk to you about comparing point clouds. Let me go quickly through it. This, oh, damn. This is the also landslides in USA, 2003, 2013, 14, 17, 17, 2003. So you can see the landslide going down and then blocking the valley. So this landslide actually evolves over time. So we compare different time to create this kind of um, evolution timeline. This is at Mount Unzen, where at Mount Unzen we have different periods, 2007, 2016, 15, 15, 16, then we compare the topography and we look where the sediment accumulates, where the sediment are being eroded. This is another map of the dome. You can see places where erosion is occur occurring around the dome but also it's going down and also accumulating here, not really going down. And across, along the, the gully, you have like here in green area where we have erosion and it's accumulating down in the gully right there where you have the pink. And to compare different uh, point cloud, different algorithm, one of them is the cone filtering methods. I will let you have a look at it by yourself. I have then a lot of different drawings so the closest point distance, it is really compared to com uh, compare two point cloud and look at each of the pairs that are closer to one another to compare it. Then you're going to have elements that look at uh, areas around it with local height. Then you have the point to mesh. So what we did earlier, you compare the mesh, uh, the, you convert the mesh into a point cloud. Point cl uh, you convert the point cloud into a mesh, and you compare compare your mesh to the point cloud. And then you have elements for DM that are not straight from top, but are also vertical. So let's say you have a surface like this. You don't want to look at it from the top. You want to look at this from this direction. Okay. So what those methods are doing, they are lo looking at the tangent of the surface, which is here. And after that, it's using either a circle or a cone. Oh, oh. Come back. Please recognize me. Okay. Or the cone to compare two elements. So it looks like the general point cloud. It's going to map the eigenvector. So those of you who don't like mathematics, forget about it. It's a term in math eigenvector. So it's going to look at the, the perpendicular to a surface. It's going to map all the points on the wall and say the points are there. So 90 degrees angle direction. So this is going to be the eigenvector. And using this is going to define what is the orientation of the surface. And based on the orientation of the surface, it's going to align this to the surface. So if you have a wall, it's not going to look at it from the top. If you have a landslide wall, it's not going to look at it from the top, but from the side. The guy who invented this is another French lag, Dimitri, Dimitri Lag. Very big guy. Don't, don't work with him. Horrible. He's very sombre. No. <laughs> to, to the point where it's really hard to even talk to him. It's like, yeah, don't talk to me. But very good. Very good algorithm. So, uh, and those algorithm, they are in Cloud Compare. In Cloud Compare, in the... Up here. 
in the plugins. Plugins Canupo. All of this is in the plugin to do this. So you can also learn it. If you go to the plugins, you press help, they explain how it works. And now I want you to look at a comparison. Also for new purpose, people use SFM just to measure surfaces and change. With Daikai, we are doing it also to measure density of soils. So when you have a landslide and you have different level of energy on the slide you plane, it's going to compress the material. From most of the data are really hard to tell where, but using the method is going to explain, you can actually go and take sample very easily to measure the, the density, but also it's virtually almost free, very, very cheap. It can be done on any surface. Existing methods to measure density means the surface to be flat or to be compact, so not loose. Here's the method that we are working on. Anywhere is okay. Any material and any direction. You're in a cave, okay. on top, okay. So it's going to explain that in a minute. And it's 12.46, we have 30 minutes, it's perfect. And Victor, your turn. うん。うん。ああ、説明する。ああ、いいかもしれないね。はい。how do we can we set up this computer so that it can present or how do we do it? Um, you want to present something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the last part. Oh, do you have the? Uh, or, or do you want to use my laptop? Data or hard drive? Ah, oh, John. Oh, he's going to use my laptop. So. So you can see Epic, Epic Game is launcher. You know that I'm doing a lot of gaming as well. Not always working. And I think there must be Steam somewhere as well. Steam Nimalaya. Do you know Steam? Steam, Epic Games, yeah, yeah. So I play a lot of Fortnite. I do Fortnite, I do Happy um, what did I do recently? Yeah, Fortnite a lot actually. What, what do you play? Oh, FIFA, oh, yeah, of course, Bola DC, yeah. That can't turn us into the e-pause. Moshe, Maka Naniga, assistant to Stewa, don't she can ever you take the side. Mr. Political Geography. 
Thank you for staying. I know it's not of your interest at all. You didn't even sleep. I was expecting you to sleep more. Oh, I would. For when I went to Japan, I was on a tenure track professorship. So for five years, I had to present. And I had a mentor who was mentoring me through the process. Each time I had a presentation, two minutes. <laughs> and then you sleep, 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 then I stopped talking, then he wakes up. Yeah, 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 I saw you. You didn't listen to anything. <laughs> then I tell him, yeah, but you know, Japanese people have very special abilities. We can concentrate and listen to people by closing our eyes. So yeah, not working, you're just sleeping. <laughs> no concentration, just sleeping. Ah, okay, so we will start and explain to you. Can we start now? Can we start? Start? Start okay? Start okay? It's very short actually, it's just a few minutes and it's going to be finished. We'll be finished before you go to Solat. Okay? But we want to do it quickly because it's going to be 15 soon otherwise. Okay. I'm not sure. 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 なんで今みんなになかったか。マスカムスタンドアパヤ、エスドア、エサトゥ、ブルー、あ、エサトゥ。だ、アパヤ、メ、ベラジャラパ。あ、エスペシャル。あ、ゲオグラフィアパヤ
Yeah, very good. Yeah, in the area of Bonpong, right? Yeah. Yes. I saw the LiDAR data. Very good. Very good. Okay. So I was afraid that you guys know already, so it would be not very interesting. Similar. Yeah, I saw a map very nice. What about you? I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah, imagery. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so for the LiDAR data, the intensity is also related to the soil moisture. So the soil roughness. So the soil quality near the surface can be, you can give some level assessments if you have all data set. I know that at UGM in geography, they are going to buy a drone uh, DJI like this year. So once you have it, you can go back many times and you can compare during the year. How, yeah. So if you have a sensor in the ground, like let's say moisture sensor, you can compare your moisture sensor data with the LiDAR data and see actually how the intensity is going to change in the soil depending on the moisture. So this is something we're doing the same actually at uh, Mount Unzen, where we work on the soil density and then the amount of water in the ground by combining LiDAR data plus near infrared. And it works right, rather well actually. Okay. Unzen? Oh, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's forbidden. Yeah, not the active one, but some. Uh, around, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty steep, actually. So we work on the dome, actually, itself. So we fly the UAV over the dome, like, several times. We lost the UAV with the LiDAR as well. We don't know where it is. The UAV fell. Expensive LiDAR UAV. Okay, so I, Daika is going to share some of the work that's been doing for his master thesis, some around the idea of using SFM and uh, moisture content and density, because using this kind of gravity set, we then use UAV rather cheap uh, near-infrared data to map the moisture contents in the bed. So the floor is yours, my friends. I'm going to even take a photograph of you while you talk. Very important. Dozo. Hmm. 
but in Indonesia, uh, the north right is not right, so this method is uh, easy to use. Ah, uh, uh, oh, sorry. After that, uh, we take a picture uh, in this area. So, uh, like this. That's all. Uh, we take uh, 50 to 80. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. This is the uh, uh, market. Mm -hmm. oh. For SFM. SFM. Yes, for SFM. After that, uh, we read that for. Uh, mm. As far as possible, without breaking the wall. Mm, the surface on the wall. Yeah. So you do it like um, it's a plane flying over it, like you would do with a UAV and a second. Wait. 
image made uh, as I graphics. Mm -hmm. So uh, after this, uh, we take it uh, again. So 60 to 80 each uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, every end. Yeah. I think this is the This process is some work process in Finnish. The next is a computing Uh, we can make uh, this uh, point of problem there. This process, uh, we, uh, I use the uh, CCD in manual. And so, oh my God. Mm -hmm. I don't like this. For every video, I I use the uh, book <laughs> 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 mm. uh, wow, wow. <laughs> After that, we are next. Uh, X, Y, Z, so example point two, point two is uh is zero, Y is minus zero point one meter. And then is uh plus plus something zero. Second,にしてみた方がいいと思うか。重すぎてもう死んでしまうかもしれない。Ah, so, ah, so, ah, 
。あなたが新しいバージョン使ってるから。あ、まあ、見せなくてもいいかもしれない。時間もそろそろないから。みんな祈りしかないといけないから。So, is using a new version of the software? I'm, I'm old version. So, it doesn't want to open it. Like old, new, like we know. <laughs> I'm outdated. データを比べたところがあるのか見せ,見せれる So here, if you, se you select on the left two point cloud and you choose to cut them, you can cut the two exactly the same place. It's going to cut the two、uh, with the same polygon, basically. But my computer is too slow, so it's having a hard time. Computer very slow, right? Maybe you can shut down our. I'll start your and look at cloud compare. There is maybe don't say, yeah. And cloud compare, there is maybe another v e r s i o open, yeah. Cloud compare,、uh, shut down this one, yeah. Okay. だいたいでいいだけだったのね。
So, thanks to his research, you get the volume, we get the mass, and he was saying we get the density, which is in gram per centimeter cube, for instance. But he said that he put it in a plastic bag, so we have water plus sediment. So you do water plus sediment, the mass, and then you dry it, and then you get dry mass. OK? For instance, at Merapi or at Unzen, density of day site or andesite, 2.6? 2.0. Because we have the density and we have the bulk T for this volume, we do density of water, which is 1, multiplied by mass, density of day site, multiplied by mass. And then we get, for this volume, an extract porosity plus water content and plus the void index. All the needs for agriculture, for civil engineering, anything you want from this simple process. The only money you have to spend is a cell phone and this. Very easy. And a tombal at home. So easy process, cheap. And civil engineering data set. Burn the carbon mass. Float it and determine how much carbon was in the... You have the density, 
much carbon you have for a density of soil, for a volume of soil. And as he was saying, very, very precise method. It's many, many thick pictures with this. Many millimeters accuracy. Thank you, Tarnia. Ah, die, die. One millimeter accuracy. So very, very good. So you have two surfaces. You have surface one and surface two with the hole. So you have one, meter, one millimeter accuracy here and one millimeter accuracy here. So you have to use it two times. And then you can calculate your volume. And you remember, I was telling you, maybe not, I was telling the students, all the density methods that exist only have error in the lab. This one, because it doesn't use all the points, he was saying GCP. Another thing he was doing is use tie points that he doesn't use for the, the computation, but he compare the location on this ruler and the computed values. So the computer tells him this is not 40, it's 40.001. Measure the error of your method. So you know also that this has an error level of that much. And I think it's maybe time for you to go 20. It's maybe too late. 1120. Um, and that, thank you. If you want to ask him any question, please do. Hello, Dayan Magutavnia. Yeah, Sila Kanya. Porosity. Void index. Oh, 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 void ratio is another one. Void ratio. Yeah, void ratio better than void index. Void ratio. So you also know how saturated your soil is, level of saturation. How much more rainfall do you need for the soil to be saturated? So this method, only Victor and I use it anywhere in the world. So very new, please feel free to use it. When I started to use SFM the first time, I started to use it in Indonesia because some of the very expensive data was not available at that time. Now it's different, but also anyone can use it. So regardless of whether from a rich background, a poor background, you can use the method. And this is the same, that's the main motivation. To obtain those information from civil engineering tools does cost a lot of money if you want to have them but you can do that for free, or almost for free. So if you have any with less money, people in, let's say, countryside who want, need this information, easy to get. Thank you. Thank you, Daikai. Oh, and I must apologize. I didn't tell Daikai that you have to present like this. PowerPoint ready, nothing. I told him we would go outside and he would show how to do it. But so, uh, much, yeah? I'm really sorry. So you have to improvise. Okay, can I close the Zoom session? Okay. Okay, thank you for Professor Robert and also Kuto Sang for the uh, nice presentation and inspiring uh, sharing session today. So once again, give a big applause for them. <laughs> okay, to close this session, uh, we would like to invite all of the participants, all the lecturers, and also Professor Gomez <laughs> uh, to take Photo. Photo. Yeah. Photo. So please come up for all of the participants. I would have been surprised if we didn't do it.
I did for me the project management very strict. We really need to need to document everything. Did you know he was a 